season. Uh, today, maybe you noticed uh, youth are in a lot more areas. Uh, we have youth running sound to lights to up there, all the different stuff so you can see scriptures and different things. You all look. I like that. That's good. I point and you look. All right. Uh, we had kids out in the lobby welcoming. We have kids everywhere because here's the thing. We believe in the next generation. We don't write it off, but we say, hey, we get to serve a part of that. For you, you might be a lot older, you might be a little older, but we're saying, hey, we're going to build a foundation so the next generation can do amazing things, and it starts even here today. So this is student takeover, and part of the goal also is to say, we come alongside like scripture, if you look at it, you have stories like Timothy, where Paul encourages Timothy, he says, hey, you're a young leader, people are going to blame you for your age, say that you're not qualified or wise enough, but don't listen to them, continue to trust who God created you to be, find your foundation in the scripture, and do amazing things. We also see a, another story, a guy named Apollos, he's like so excited, preaching the gospel. And uh, Priscilla and Aquila, a couple, are older, wiser. They hear him, his excitement. They're supporting him, but they also bring him to the side and they say, hey, really good job. And then they're like, but just so you know, this, theolo- this is what this means. And they help him along the way so that he can have amazing impact in the future. And that's what this church does too. We support the next generation. We come alongside them. We say, hey, man, God's going to do amazing things. And we're coming right here saying we're going to support you as you do that. So student takeover, that's what the goal is. But not only that, you don't have to hear from me today, which some of you are like, yes, it's that Sunday. All right, you have an amazing message I am so excited for. I am so excited for this one. He's our youth leader. He's also related to me. He's my son. And I'm just amazed at the man that he is, who God created him to be. So with that, would you guys put your hands together? Welcome up, Joshua. So they let me back on stage. <laughs> um, ooh, certificates. I'll give that to you. So it's really exciting for me. Um, when I started here, our youth was probably like three kids. Um, my sister was one of them, so I don't even count her. And if you guys look around, all of us are wearing these shirts. Um, we have a ton of them right here. Uh, over here, they're everywhere. We got people upstage, and um, it's really just crazy to see how we've just grown so rapidly um but yeah just it's crazy to see everyone (laughs) so yeah they asked me to speak again um and I was like oh gosh like are you guys serious like me (laughs) you take over all right like I was like yeah let's do it um let's just have them you know I'll I'll do cameras and my dad's like nah (laughs) we want you to speak and I was like okay so uh off the bat, um, we are skillful at the art of making excuses, right? You parents, your kids, you ask them, hey, I need you to take out the trash. All right, mom, I'll do it later. Or, uh, you know, your wife asks you to do something, and you're like, yeah, I'll do it later. Uh, can you fix the sink? Oh, I don't have the right tools. We just love making excuses. That's just what, what we do by nature, right? You guys are looking at me like, <laughs> but, um, just, just from a very young age, we've just been taught that, you know, if we don't want to do something, make it. Like, you know, my dog ate my homework. Um, my dad, I've heard this one a lot from him. Someone's like, hey, you want to hang out? Yeah, you know what? Let me ask my wife. I'll get back to you. Never gets back to you. <laughs> um, I, I work in a Mexican restaurant now, and they, the scheduling is crazy. They always are like, hey, um, can you come in today? I'm like, you know what, I'm out of town right now. Um, that's my favorite excuse. Uh, I'm not out of town, I'm actually like five minutes away watching Netflix in my pajamas. And I, I just, I love making excuses, you know, like in the Christian world, we find all sorts of excuses to not obey God's word. We just do it naturally, it's like, that's our second instinct. Um, we say like, you know what, I'm not a pastor. That's what I told him when he asked me to, to speak. Or um, it's not my gift, or I've already filled my quota for serving once a month. Beth has been spamming me with planning center notifications, like, hey, I already did it. Like, I'm good. Um, or I'm too busy, I'm too tired, too old, too young. That's the things we say. Um, so like, let me tell you guys something, right? The Holy Spirit, it's in us, and the Holy Spirit never sleeps. So technically, we should never be sleeping on that, right? <laughs> So uh, I'm going to be talking about Jeremiah if you guys want to get to that in the Bible. But um, Jeremiah was a young guy. 
uh, around the age of 17 when God called him for his mission. And he had every excuse ready. So when God called him to be a prophet, his excuses were often our excuses for not obeying God's voice when he calls. Countering every excuse was a promise from God. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to the nations. It's Jeremiah 1.5. Um, it says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Um, being a prophet back then, it was very demanding, much more than a priest. Um, you guys know, like, prophets, priests. Uh, the priest duties were pretty predictable. Everything back then was written in law. You know, priest did this, this, and this. Um, but being a prophet was like you youth on a summer day. You know, you wake up, you're, you go downstairs, you eat your favorite cereal, and you're like, what am I going to do today? Like, I don't know. Just go with the flow. Like, what are my parents? Let's just go. That's how it was for prophets. It was like, um, the prophet never knew from one day to the next what the Lord would call him to do, um, say or do. A prophet worked to change the present so that a nation would have a future. So when Jeremiah was called, I look at it as this. Um, he was trying to tell people what they were doing wrong and try to have them repent so that they would be saved. And if I was a 17-year-old around the age and I was told I had to go tell a nation that they're all sinners, I would be terrified. <laughs> um, I look at it as like trying to redeem the people. Um, my parents helped me survive elementary school. Uh, I remember like fifth grade, fourth grade, I had a science project. I was like, you know what? I made excuses, like I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then it was the night before and I'm like, hey guys, so I have a, a project, a little project. And I remember this so, like, just perfectly. And they were just like, a science project. Okay. Yeah, and it's due tomorrow, and it's 8 o'clock at night. We were just watching cartoons all day. And I just remember my parents being so mad at me. And I was like, oh. And I was like, I'll never do it again. I did it again the next year. <laughs> but they were just helping me survive, so I wasn't stuck in fifth grade. And I graduated high school. So, hey, there's that, right? Um, <laughs> That's what matters, thanks. So yeah, priests dealt with externals uh, like rituals, sacrifices, offering services, whereas a prophet tried to reach and change hearts. Um, priests ministered primarily to the individuals with various needs, and prophets, on the other hand, like I said, addressed whole nations, and usually the people they addressed didn't want to hear the message. Um, I mean, imagine you're doing something wrong your entire life. It's your, how you live, and someone was like, you know what, you're a sinner. Um, not coming off like well, right? Uh, so Jesus too was called to be a prophet, as you guys know. He traveled all around the world um, so that people could change and that their spot in heaven would be guaranteed. Um, Jesus spoke to the hearts of many people. A lot of people didn't like his message, and unfortunately, um, that cost him his life. He died for us. God may assign us a demanding task, but his call keeps us going when we don't want to go and are ready to quit. We have the promise of God's purpose. Uh, again, I'm going to read it. Uh, Jeremiah 1.5, it says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. The word no in that verse is much more than, you know, the word no. I <laughs> someone asked me, what does no mean? It's like one of those words where you have to like define it with the actual word. What do you mean? No is like to know. Um, but it like carries the idea of recognition of the worth and the purpose of the person who is known. Um, God knew Jeremiah. He chose Jeremiah and appointed Jeremiah. When God calls us to do things, he knows us and knows that we can do that thing that he's set us out to do. He was known by a name and handpicked by God and commissioned to serve. Those acts give one a great sense of purpose. The promise of God's purpose allows us to let go of our own plans and receive God's plans without fear. So like Jeremiah and Jesus, we need to accept that our future is not our own. We are God's and he has a distinct plan and purpose for our lives. We always want to work on our own time. Like, you know, some of us are very organized. Um, I'm not. I'm more of a go-with-the-flow person, but 
when God is like, you know what, I want you to go serve in Mexico or I want you to go speak to that person about Jesus at the restaurant you're eating at. We're like, oh, no, no, I'm good. Um, I think I'll pass. We start coming up with excuses like that. Um, and that's not what we should be doing. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I'm super nervous, just to let you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to read Jeremiah 1.6 now. It says, O sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I am too young. Jeremiah felt inadequate as a public speaker. He felt like all of us when we're called to do something that we don't normally do. Um, felt like me right now. I hated public speaking in, in, uh, in school. I hated it. I think it's like the number one fear across all people. Um, with reason, right? <laughs> um, but he felt like me and like all of us when we are asked to do a task we don't feel equipped to do. When I was asked to do a 3 and 30 a couple weeks ago, they were like, hey, we want you to do 3 and 30. Um, you're going to speak for 10 minutes. And I was just like, 10 minutes? That's terrible. Um, okay, sure, I did it. I, I survived. And then shortly after, they came up to me again, and they were like, this time we want you to preach again. I was like, oh, for 10 minutes? No, no, for a whole service. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I wasn't that bad, right? <laughs> So I, I start to feel anxious, super nervous, um, but I prayed about it a lot, and God gave me peace. Um, since I was young, I'd say I was a pretty introverted person. Speaking out is something that I've always had to work on. My parents know, like, you know, Josh, you got to speak up. Stop mumbling. Um, but you know what? God has a way to overcome weaknesses and our insufficiencies, doesn't he? I've learned over the years that the person most aware of their own weaknesses or inadequacy is usually the person that is most dependent on God's all-sufficiency. The people that aren't, those are the ones that struggle more. Um, my weaknesses, like public speaking right now, that's what causes me to rely upon God because I know I can't do it on my own. His strength is made perfect in my weaknesses and His glory is manifested through my flaws. Our talent will always appear inadequate to people. It's never perfect. And, um, you know, God always equips those he calls. He never will call us to do something he knows that we cannot do, not alone, but with him. Um, I'm going to read Jeremiah 1. It says, Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Um, that verse is very unique just because it's saying that, you know, the touch was not so much to, like, purify as it was to inspire and empower Jeremiah on his mission that he's being sent to do. Um, it was a symbolic, it was symbolic of the gift of prophecy that Jesus gave to Jeremiah. Um, and just notice how Jesus gave that gift to Jeremiah specifically and gave him and equipped that gift so that he could go and be a prophet. God uses not the most gifted and talented person, so, you know, I am not the best public speaker, obviously. Um, I could tell you someone like, I don't know, I, I'll say my dad. He's a pretty good speaker, right? You would think, why not have him speak today on this message? Or why not have all these people do these things? But, you know, the Bible is just filled with these people that you wouldn't think are meant or cut out for that mission, and they end up doing it better than anyone could have imagined. It's like that in our everyday lives, too. I mean, not to the extent of being a prophet or whatever, but, you know, you guys are faced with things every day and work and school and all that. Um, God uses the most unlikely persons to shake a church or a community or a nation and never underestimate the power of the touch, especially when it's God's. Jeremiah said to God, I am too young. The word youth back then, it was looked down on, you know, um, I mean, even today, right, youth, uh, you guys walked in church and you have, you see the kids dancing over here. Um, they're always on TikTok making dumb little dances. So like when someone like a youth goes on stage to tell you guys about Jesus, of course you're going to be like, what the heck is this kid going to say? Like, <laughs> you know, so I can only imagine back then Bible times. I know they didn't have TikTok, um, but Jeremiah had his own thing. Um, and, you know, so it was looked down on. Um, 
anyone unmarried or in his teens, early 20s. Uh, most scholars think Jeremiah was around the age of 17, so just to give you guys an idea, when he was called. Uh, his, his answer to Jesus saying he's too young is not so much about his age, but so much of his wisdom. I mean, back then, Bible times, people were living to like way longer than we are now. <laughs> so, you know, being 17, you're a fresh, cute little person. <laughs> Um, and to be able to go tell people and be a prophet at 17, that is, that's unheard of, right? Um, he felt inferior, inexperienced, and intimidated by the size of the task which God was summoning him. God's call may come at a time that we don't feel is right for us. Let's be honest, it's never going to feel right for us, right? We're always going to be pushing it back, pushing it back. You know, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. It's a science project, I'll do it later until the night of... Um, we have the promise of God's presence. The Lord replied in Jeremiah 7, uh, Don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and I will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. In that verse, uh, there's a condition to the promise that Jesus gives Jeremiah. Before Jeremiah could experience God's presence, he had to go where God sent him and speak what God told him and reject fear. So not where we want to go. You know, we always curve things how we want them. God calls Jeremiah to do this specific thing, and he promises him that. But he has to do what Jesus wants, not what we want. You know, my mom was like, go talk to that shy kid over there. Go out of your way and talk to him. Oh, mom, like, really? And I'd be like, over there, standing by him. How's it going? Good. All right. Come back. And my mom's like, really? <laughs> no, we have to do exactly what God calls us to do. Um, and mom, definitely mom for the youth, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, when God calls us to a task, he does not give us a road map to follow and then leaves us to our resources. He doesn't just abandon us. He wasn't like, Jeremiah, I want you to be a prophet and go tell this nation that they're sinners and try to save them. And then, good luck. No. Um, <laughs> God walks with us. His presence gives us the strength to stand in the face of every assault. He will never abandon us. He's always there. Jesus felt that same presence. He and, his, and the Father were one. He could go on because God walked with him. What a difference it is that just, know, that like just knowing that God is constantly with us. We forget that all the time. When we're in hard situations, we close ourselves off um, and we begin, to, we begin to make excuses of not seeking out people and we forget that God is literally with us 24-7. The Holy Spirit is in us, right? Like I said, never sleeping, never resting. Um, the Lord did not give Jeremiah a joyful message to preach. Like I said, uh, it was actually um, a message of tra like judgment, basically. Uh, consequently, Jeremiah would be misunderstood, persecuted, arrested, and imprisoned. More than, once in his, one, more than once his life was threatened. The people did not want to hear the truth. Jeremiah told them plainly that they were defying the Lord, disobeying the law, and destined for judgment. So like I said... He literally had to go tell an entire nation that they were not doing what was right in God's eyes. And when it's a 17-year-old kid against, let's say, the city of San Bernardino, think about that. <laughs> um, God used the image of a boiling pot to communicate his coming wrath. Uh, Jeremiah 1.13 says, Then the Lord spoke to me again and asked, What do you see now? And I replied, I see a pot of boiling water spilling from the north. The pot represented the nation of Babylon that would invade and conquer Israel, the nation he was speaking to. And the reason for the judgment was Israel's idolatry and rebellion against God's righteous will. They were um, creating false idols um, and rebelling against God's word. And Jesus... Uh, his teaching contained mercy and judgment, grace and punishment. Jesus' teachings were dangerous too. Um, it cost him his life. People didn't want to hear the truth. We're hurt by the truth because we don't want to change. We just want to keep pushing it back. Um, but what God says through us uh, may be dangerous, but God gives us the strength to endure it. 
we have the promise of God's prevail. Jeremiah 1, 18 through 19 says, For see today I have made you strong, like a fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the, the whole land, the kings, officials, priests, and people of Judah. They will fight you, but they will fail. For I am with you, and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Notice the way he describes how he's with him. He says a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls. So, I mean, back then, that is like, I mean, nowadays we don't really use that, but anyone that works construction, you know, just think of a huge, whatever the best steel is. Tim? <laughs> there you go. Like, <laughs> the best steel, right? They're solid and unshakable like the God who conceived them and the prophet whom they would come to characterize. God reassured Jeremiah. He literally says, you know, they will attack you, but they will not be able to overcome you. That's our life. We will always be attacked by um, people, by words, by the fear of judgment, but through God, they will not overcome us. They may weaken us, but never overcome us. The person who stands with God will prevail, and with God we are that fortified city. Alone we are helpless, but with God we, pre we prevail, our God is steadfast. The most known example of a person I was thinking of, of a man who prevailed with the Lord, is um, Martha Luther King Jr. He had a dangerous message, um, and he didn't prevail on his own. He, it wasn't his public speaking that got him to where he was. Um, and he said it was because of Jesus. He said God gave him the power. Uh, I'll read you this quote by him. He says, Even in the inevitable moments when all seems hopeless, men know that without hope they cannot really live, and in agonizing desperation they cry for the bread of hope. When our days become dreary with low hovering clouds of despair, and when our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil and a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. In the midst of outer dangers, I have felt an inner calm and known resources of strength that only God could give. In many instances, I have felt the power of God transforming the fatigue of despair into the buoyancy of hope. So, just like Jesus, you know, MLK died getting his message across, um, but he did it through the strength of God. God was actually expecting immediate action from Jeremiah um, when he called him. He, God said in Jeremiah 117, um, he said, get up and prepare for action. Go out and tell, every, tell them everything I tell you to say. Do not be afraid of them or I will make you look foolish in front of them. God literally said, all right, Jeremiah, roll up your sleeves. We're going to work. Um, probably didn't have sleeves, probably had a robe. He said, tying up your robe. Lift it up, we're going. Um, God called Jeremiah to act. He called uh, to move out among people. He was called to deliver an offensive message. Um, and he wouldn't be welcomed, nor he would be accepted. He would anger his hearers. Um, imagine that, just being 17 years old, and God calls you and says, Hey, Josh, I want you to be a prophet and go tell these people that uh, they are sinning and they need to repent so that it can uh, save them. All right, when? Now. <laughs> like, you know what? Actually, I'm out of town right now. <laughs> uh, God expects obedience immediately, and if we don't, we are in danger of God's wrath. I mean, how terrifying is that? He says, do not be afraid of them, or I will make you look foolish in front of them. God's wrath, or a whole nation that wants to kill you for saying that they're terrible. Do not be afraid of them, and I will make, or I will make you look foolish in front of them. Immediate obedience is the only appropriate response when God calls. I'll give you an example in my life. Uh, my siblings will know. Um, when I would wake up to my mom at 8 a.m. in the morning singing worship music, it meant one of two things. One, she's finally decided to try out for the worship team, or we are deep cleaning every square inch of the house. It was terrible. Um, 
I was, I would lay in bed like, oh gosh, waiting for her to come through the door. Like, rise and shine and you've got the glory, glory. That was her, anytime she wanted to clean. And there was no escaping it. There was no escaping it. I mean, my sister can tell you, all of us, my dad, you know what? I got to go write my sermon today. (laughs) Um, We would spend the whole day deep cleaning and... If I tried to escape it, I would face the wrath of my mother and Achankla. And let me tell you what, that comes a close second to God's wrath. (laughs) Jesus obeyed. um, Whatever you think of Jesus, remember this. His heart was a willing and obedient heart. He always did what his father directed. There was no hesitation, no questioning, no circumventing, only immediate action. Unlike us kids, when our parents ask us to do something simple, okay, mom, we'll do it later, I promise. Next day, no, you didn't, you're grounded, oh, okay. (laughs) So, um, if you guys feel like this is you, um, you have been running or trying to escape from God's calling to you, I want to challenge you guys um, and encourage you that it's time to stop running. Um, Stop avoiding. Stop saying that you guys are too old, too young, not smart enough. You're not a public speaker. Um, You're just not in the right time. It's never going to be the right time for us. Never. It won't as long as we keep making excuses. Um, It's time to start going to God because through him we can prevail through anything. If Jeremiah could go tell an entire nation and be a prophet for God at the age of 17. You can do it at the age of 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, however old you may be. Um, But, you know, if that is you today and you need prayer, I want you guys to step out of your comfort zone because I know it's awkward and we don't want to seek help. We're embarrassed maybe, but come down. We have an amazing prayer team that is ready to pray with you guys. Um, But, yeah, love you guys. Yeah, I'm going to close this in prayer. I'm going to close this in prayer. Uh, Dear Jesus, I just pray, I thank you for, um, I just thank you for the youth here today. I thank you for the opportunity of being able to speak today. I thank you for the strength you have given us. And I just pray that if anyone here today um, is that, is that Jeremiah is is afraid or is running um, from your calling, that you can just open up their hearts and that you can... um, Just give them that hope and give them that strength that they need to overcome whatever it is that they're facing. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you so much for the people and this church family here today, Lord. And I just pray this in your holy name. Amen.